Well, thanks very much. I'm uh, honored to be part of this panel, and I want to thank Rob J Johnson and George Soros, as everyone else has. You see that I've called this the political economy of controlling systemic risk. The first point is that the controlling systemic risk is what uh, we, we've asked policymakers to do in the future. We recognize they didn't do it this time around. And uh, the, the political economy of it, I'm going to argue, is simply to redefine the task in a self-serving way. And uh, so the, 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 uh, I'm hoping that this works for me properly, yes. Um, to control anything, we have to first define it. And if it's a good definition so we can, can control it well, uh, it should lead to a verifiable metric. So uh, how do official definitions of s systemic risk shape up in the score? Well, uh, basically, they uh, rely very much on judgment. They talk about the potential for a substantial spillover of institutional defaults, both within the financial sector and then from the financial sector to the real sector. Now, this definition has a, a, a missing element because for s very systemic reasons, the, the, the substantial spillovers of actual defaults have remained largely hypothetical. This is, in fact, the message of the previous paper. Uh, and this is because authorities choose instinctively to intervene into the default process by supporting the credit of what they call systemically important firms. I like to call them difficult to fail and unwind. That is, the, the real problem is that they're administratively, politically, and economically difficult to fail and unwind. And you would think that financial reform would look at making that, those tasks easier. Now, uh, these firms allow themselves to become uh, economically insolvent, uh, and they also uh, expect that when they do become economically insolvent, they'll be able to put their losses to the taxpayer. So there is a taxpayer put. Now, this can't go on forever. Uh, authorities will learn. But we've had a tremendous escalation in the United States from the losses of the SNL insurance mess in 1989 uh, to what we're seeing today. Now, uh, officials are very interested in blame avoidance. They don't want to be held uh, responsible for, for anything that went wrong. And they also enjoy what I call mission simplification. So. Uh, both of these things distort the public policy d debate. So what is the official definition of systemic risk? Well, it, it, uh, it is simply that there's something wrong in the private sector in how they manage risk, too, too much leverage, too much interest rate risk. Uh, and so the, the systemic risk was caused by mistakes made by these difficult to fail and unwind firms. And this diagnosis leads immediately to a treatment plan uh, that would toughen capital requirements, close gaps in the structure of regulation, and extend new powers to regulators so that they can deal with this bad risk management. But this diagnosis and the treatment plan are really superficial because they fail to address the endogenous role that safety net subsidies to, to serious risk taking uh, play in incentivizing firms to take action politically in terms of money politics and economically to attain and strengthen their status as difficult to fail and unwind firms. As they, they have worked hard at becoming bigger, uh, more complex, and more politically powerful. So uh, we have to understand that although the textbooks talk about central banks as trying to maximize social welfare uh, with instruments that are capable of doing that, we, we usually leave out the restraints under which they operate. Now I've listed a bunch of them here. I can't. Uh, do justice to them in time I have available to me, but I do want to suggest that the two most important are the two that change very much and, and, and uh, the, the restraints strengthen in a crisis. One is restraints on the information available to the central banks. And the other one is uh, restraints from political pressure and influence. That it, uh, if you are a firm becoming weak economically, uh, it pays you to become strong politically. And it's actually easier to become strong politically than to become strong economically. So what we have is very serious incentive um, conflict that expands these safety net subsidies uh, in terms of the, the ability of reg, regula, regulatees, regulated institutions, to uh, influence decisions that are made by top policymakers 
and uh, also to expand the burden avoidance opportunity. So uh, what, what I'm leading to all of this is that uh, incentive conflict feeds this, the myopia that we see, this very sh uh, short-term oriented decisions that lead central banks to rescue these uh, difficult to fail and unwind zombie firms from the consequences of their aggressive risk management. So you see this cartoon. Uh, we've made this poor um, financial institution that got in trouble um, not physically attractive. Um, the sh shark manages to take a bite out of him. It's not that uh, they're getting away scot-free, but almost scot-free. And the central bank comes with a helicopter and uh, gets them out of the the, the, uh, the water and away from the shark. Now, you have to understand there's two effects of this that, that aren't exactly in the cartoon. One is that somebody has to pay for this helicopter, and that's taxpayers. And uh, also that this rescue has consequent effects on expectations of future bailouts. That I, I maintain that this SNL insurance mess, which is a relatively small problem, actually taught the uh, financial institutions about the taxpayer put, but it didn't teach taxpayers about the taxpayer put. And this is what strengthened the, the money politics and, and got us to where we are. And I think it, it taught um, institutions around the world. It wasn't just in the United States. Uh, so what I'm saying is there's a verifiable additional symptom of systemic risk, and that's that these difficult to fail and unwind firms and sectors can command implicit and explicit life support from national safety nets, uh, and this makes official definitions of systemic risk both inadequate because they leave this symptom out and uh, self-serving because they make their life easier and let them blame other people for the problems. So what, what comes out of this way of thinking about systemic risk is that widespread financial weakness is only a precondition for having systemic risk. It's a precondition for bailouts, and. Uh, if your notion of reform uh, centers around empowering some team of macroprudential regulators to monitor sectoral weakness, you're only addressing part of the problem. Because it, th this problem didn't really creep up on uh, authorities as much as they would like you to believe. It's rather they hoped they could get by without doing anything about it. And so systemic risk uh, is generated then not only by uh, aggressive risk management and losses created in, in the financial sector, the private financial sector, but also an unhealthy competition for regulatory clients, for turf. And this is not only within the United States between agencies, but around the world. You know, England and the U.S. and various countries in the EU, Japan, compete for the right to regulate various businesses, which brings GDP to them, brings, again, uh, for the politicians, um, an income. So. Uh, and secondly, the, these, there are various factors that a firm can manipulate, or collections of firms can manipulate, to, to make it politically or administratively difficult to fail or unwind the firm. So here's the, the incentive effects of all this that I've, I've labeled the safety net interest rate cut in credit support, and you see speculators jumping into the safety net, and you see a central bank ambulance sitting, waiting to help in case the safety net doesn't hold. So, it, you, to understand how we got to where we are, you have to understand that there was a pre-crisis buildup of systemic risk, and this buildup was principally in structured securitizations, and it was generated by shortcutting and outsourcing due diligence. Say that again, outsourcing and shortcutting due diligence. Let's let the person down the chain do the due diligence. Uh, don't do as much in our firm because we can get rid of this trash, this garbage. And uh, this was done both in the private and the government sector. So for the private sector to blame the government is somewhat unfair. Uh, for the government to blame the private sector is extremely unfair. Uh, so the, the, while, the, while the bubble was building, authorities failed to do what would be their natural duty in any ethical analysis, to isolate and respond to the safety net consequences that were going to go to the taxpayers uh, of this all too reversible set of risk transfers that were feeding this this bubble. So the, the fact that uh, if we want to reduce the depth and frequency of future crises, it's not going to be enough to tweak the mechanics of risk control, which is all the proposals I, I've seen seek to do. A parallel effort must be made to rework the recruiting, the training, the missions, the duties, and the incentives of the systems operators. 
I, I would to tell you some of the things I would do. There isn't time to do, say much of it here. I would establish a West Point for, for top regulators uh, and, and give them the kind of esprit de corps and toughness that is needed to face crisis pressures. I would make sure that they trained their staff for the possibility of a crisis simulation exercise, fire drills. We do this for children in schools. Why wouldn't we do it for, for safety nets that can do such harm? And uh, I would change the oaths of office, and, and I would change the way we, we pay top regulators as well. I'd introduce some deferred compensation tied to the avoidance of crisis during uh, the few years that followed them, <laughs> not just the years they were in office. So we have these deeply ingrained layers of incentive conflict that that regulatory reform really should address. The first is asymmetric information. Authorities say, we didn't know, we couldn't see. Well, that creates an easy alibi and opportunities for cover-up. If they don't show us what they know, we can't be sure that whether they totally uh, misserved the public or not. Second, uncertain holds on position, shortens the horizon. If you look at Ben Bernanke, uh, there was a mention of the horizons in, in the, early on in the uh, previous talk, that he was not reappointed until almost the last possible minute, which kept the possibility for the industry and, and Congress to dictate to him uh, what, was, what he was going to do. And uh, this is in the face of the fact we talk about an independent Fed, 14-year terms, but in fact, uh, the horizon is very, very short. And uh, I'll just uh, skip, skip the uh, uh, last four, but the last three, last three, I'd like to say there's also this question of the dysfunctional accountability. It's wrong to say that the authorities in the United States and Britain and, and Europe are not accountable. They, they are accountable, but they're accountable in a dysfunctional way to the industry. The industry has the power to get the press to, to misrepresent what they're doing and uh, to criticize them for the wrong things. So a complete program reform should mitigate these difficulties by improving compensation structures uh, performance measures, measurement, and reporting responsibility. So how are, the, how, is, how are they reporting to us today what they do? Well, this cartoon, which I just love, uh, shows the Fed as a lifeguard carrying a shark who looks like it's about to eat him. Uh, it, it's labeled lenders, and in the sea we have uh, tax bills, people that are going to have to pay the tax bills for this. And the, the central banks around the world are not responsible for measuring the distribution effects. And this conference has a lot, a lot of concern about distribution effects. Uh, but, and that violates duties of loyalty, competence, and care that the central bank ought to owe us. They ought to at least tell us who's paying and how much it is. Uh, of course they don't do it, because they don't have to. That uh, it, it reminds me of, of one of my favorite uh, lines from The Simpsons. Bart Simpson says, I didn't do it. Nobody saw me do it. You can't prove I did it anyway. And, so the key step is that better performance measurement at these difficult to fail and unwind firms and also at their regulators. So uh, we see there's this layering of blame for the crisis. So we've got to make the taxpayers' stake in the safety net transparent, or at least more transparent. And my proposal would be first to task the managers of financial firms with reporting to their regulators interval estimates of the value of the safety net benefits they receive. For many institutions, that'd be easy. They're not getting a whole lot. But for the difficult to fail and unwind firms, it would be difficult. And the task could be streamlined, though, by requiring particular types of securities to be issued. I discussed that a little bit in the paper that will be on the website. And we should then task the regulators with examining, by which I mean challenging these estimates, estimating correlations across institutions, and aggregating acceptable estimates across their clientele. But again, we can't let them stop there. We've got to have someone over them uh, so task them with reporting and justifying their estimates to a safety net accountability office and task this office with reporting the aggregate value of subsidies publicly on a regular basis. Now, why do I think uh, we can do this? Well, there's an awful lot of work in finance, actually, uh, going about this in different ways. You have to remember, first of all, an estimate is not just a point estimate, it's an interval. So we get an interval of estimates, and the big thing is the interval's moving up, we know we're getting into trouble. So why do I want to create a specialized information agency? Don't we have enough agencies? Well, we've got to separate accountability to taxpayers for mismonitoring the safety net subsidies, which is one of the things the Fed is actually willing to admit in the United States that it did, uh, from the accountability for policing them. Because if someone can say there's a problem developing 
and then the regulators say, oh, no, there isn't, or we're not going to do something about it. They'll be accountable for not doing that. So we can improve this mission further by having a fund of deferred compensation tied to relevant performance measures, and as I said, by detailing the fiduciary responsibilities to taxpayers in their oaths of office. So here's what I believe has been going on, that we had uh, government rescues around the world. Here I'm showing in America, because that's the way the cartoonists drew it, um, a man named Alath who gave me permission to use this, in fact, and change it. Um, and he's throwing a lifesaver to this man who we can tell by his cufflinks and everything is, is very well off. It turns out when he, he's rescued, he jumps in the, the boat, uh, throws the government official overboard, puts a pirate flag on the boat, and uh, the boat is now called Proposed Reforms, uh, so that he can do business as usual and says, thanks a lot, sucker. Thank you. <laughs>